listen only mode. Hello everybody and uh, welcome to the Dig Deep Coaching uh, Cyclocross webinar here this evening. Uh, thank you very much for everybody attending. My name is Stephen Geller, I'm one of the, the directors of Dig Deep Coaching and uh, I'll be hosting the uh, webinar this evening along with uh, my two partners and the people here will be fielding your questions, Zane Field and, and Dan Fielding. Um, so Dig Deep Coaching is a global cycling and triathlon coaching company. Uh, we coach people on all levels and ranges of, uh, of ability, so right from people from their very first race, be it cyclocross, uh, triathlon, uh, mountain bike and whatever it is, right up to elite and professional level. So uh, I'm sure you'll all be getting a few emails and have seen what we do. And um, of course, we like to, to help uh, people across the world. So again, we're very proud in, in what we do and also the team of coaches that we have. So um, we're going to start going through the, uh, the information and the, the questions. Just like to thank everybody for the questions that has been sent in. Uh, we've literally had hundreds of questions and uh, a really big attendance here this evening. I think it goes to show the popularity and the growth of cyclocross uh, both in New Kent, Ireland and of course across the world with people from, from all over joining us here this evening. So I welcome you wherever part of the world that you're in. Uh, and um, we're going to try and get through as much as possible. Um, so I'm just going to go on to the next slide. Okay, so uh, the team that we have uh, with us here today and the people who are going to be answering your questions is Ian Field. Probably doesn't need much of an introduction to those people who are uh, affiliated with the cyclocross world. Ian is a four-time uh, national mountain uh, cyclocross champion, uh, one of the uh, top-ranked um, cyclocross riders in Europe and certainly in the world has been ranked in the top 20 in the world. Uh, has represented Great Britain numerous times in, in world championships and will uh, soon be embarking on the World Tour again, heading off to Vegas on Saturday for the first round, and certainly we wish him all, uh, all the best. Ian is one of our coaches here in uh, Dig Deep Coaching, and we're very proud to have him on board, and thank you very much, Ian, for attending this evening. Um, do you want to say hello, Ian? Hi. Hope everyone can hear me fine. Thanks for having me. Cool. And uh, we also have Dan Fleming. Dan is also one of the directors of uh, Dig Deep Coaching. Uh, a previous um, European professional cyclist racing at the, the highest level across the world on the road. Um, he is also uh, an ex-British mountain bike marathon champion, uh, has won numerous races across the globe, and he's also uh, one of the, the coaches here and, and also works and coaches with, with Ian Field. And again, Dan, thank you very much for attending this evening. Do you want to give everybody a, a big hello? Yeah, hello everybody. Thanks for attending the webinar this evening. Great. Um, listen, hopefully we're able. Everybody's able to hear us uh, loud and clear. We do know sometimes there might be a bit of interference with uh, individual laptops, and sometimes people can can have some issues. Uh, so if there is anything, please put it in the panel. There's a wee box there that you can ask questions. So if there is an issue, put your hand up and uh, say something there, and we'll see what we can do. Uh, but also during the day. Uh, and during the webinar here, we're going to obviously go through all the questions, as many questions that as possible as uh, has been put to us. Uh, but at the end, if we have time, we might go through some more that anybody can enter in. So if you hear something and you feel like you want to ask, you want it expanded on, type it in the box on your panel, on your question box, and I'll maybe try and get to it at the end. Uh, so what we'll do is we're going to go through um, as many as we can. A lot of the questions that were asked are obviously quite similar to each other, so we're trying to cover as many topics as possible. So I've put it really into three different sections. So the first one we're going to talk about is training. So there's much questions on training and preparation for cyclocross. Uh, the next one is racing, a lot of aspects um, on actually you know, the tactics of racing and equipment and whatnot. And then the last section is new, so people who are new to the sport, with a lot of newbies coming into cyclocross are asking questions. Um, how to really get the most out of cyclocross and you know some beginner questions. So, uh, so let's get started. Okay, so uh, first one is on training. Um, and Ian, this is uh, this is to you. So um, somebody's asking here, how can I incorporate running into my training? Right. Yeah, we had a lot of questions about running, and it's kind of something that 
gets asked a lot because um, I don't know whether it's whether it's the coverage of cyclocross or photographers thought that um, majority of photos seem to be with running with the bike during a race um, and so there's this misconception that kind of running is a is a large part of cyclocross but in actual fact in terms of percentage time of a race spent running it's, it's very minimal um, and so you hear people going for like one hour steady jogs or even even longer kind of 15 20 K runs um, but they're not they're not kind of um, really conducive to to actual cyclocross um, racing um, so basically um, the best kind of way to introduce running into your um, training is to introduce it in specific cyclocross sessions um, so once twice a week with your cyclocross bike uh, go to your go to your cross specific kind of training area and incorporate your running within that um, it's important to practice the running with a bike because the running always takes place not just kind of on its own you're always fatigued from cycling before and then obviously after the run you've got to jump back on your on your bike and get get going again um, so incorporating it into a cyclocross session is the best way of introducing it really. Okay. There's Thanks, two man. obviously distinct um, ways of running, flat running and then hill running. Um, the best way to practice flat running is just football fields kind of um, riding the long section of a football pitch, dismounting on a corner, run the short section and uh, all the way around kind of thing. And then, obviously, running banks with the bike on your shoulder is entirely different to running without a bike. So that's why I like to keep it specific and keep it short. The majority of running in cross is approximately 10 to 20 seconds long, so quite explosive. So um, it will be a reoccurring theme in this, but keep things specific to what you do in a race. Um, I think there's a UCI rule where you're not meant to run for more than 10% of your race distance. So again, there's kind of rulings in place to stop it turning into a running race, really. So I think if you are um, short on time, it's better to get the specific cross training done with your bike, um, with it on your shoulder while you're running, and then incorporating it in that cross session where you're riding before and after the run because it is totally different um, to going just simply for a jog and also going for a, a run on its own can be really detrimental to your legs the first time you do it so just keep it short specific and explosive like you will in a race um, just I suppose a wee bit on that Ian uh, I suppose one of my questions and, and one that I know somebody's asked here is uh, when, when you are running, you know, how do you, do you decide during a competition whether to uh, to push, you know, uh, suitcase carry or shoulder? What's your kind of pre preference when certainly in a, in a race situation? Um, I think it obviously differs situation to situation, but a fundamental rule would be if you've got off because the going is so tough you can't ride, whether it be mud, sand, etc., it means that obviously your bike's being slowed down significantly that you're forced to run so that's the point you need to get your bike up and away from whatever's stopping it um, so shouldering the bike even on a flat run when it's super muddy or sandy is really important because you're just wasting energy dragging your bike through those conditions mm -hmm. and also when um, you're doing a run uphill it's really much better to get the bike out of the way on your shoulder. You can lean into the banking and really kind of just properly run up the hill using your, your free arm to help your running technique rather than um, suitcase carrying where you're a little bit more hindered. Um, obviously, if it's just barriers or hurdles, whatever you want to call them, just a suitcase carries fine and then obviously if it's a really short banking um, like you can see in the picture there little short bank off quick shoulder um, suitcase carry to the top 
and then get back on. So it's deciding when you need to get your bike off the floor and obviously if it's if it's a decent length run you need to get your bike on your shoulder and save energy because it is harder to obviously suitcase carry your bike out to the side. Cool. Thank you very much, Ian. Good. Um, okay, next one, Dan. Uh, what type of threshold interval training should you do? Um, an example would be, would it be minute on, minute off, or kind of pyramid training, 20 minute of threshold, etc. So what's your what's your take on on uh, on that? Um, I think there's many different there's many different training sessions you can use for cyclocross. Many different ways to prepare. And obviously, it depends on the time of year. Um, Certainly, right now we're coming into the into the racing season, and I think the shorter and the more race uh, specific sessions um, are key. Um, the main thing to consider <coughs> in cyclocross is that um, the efforts aren't necessarily, or in a race, the demands of the race aren't. Um, you're not riding just at threshold. It's very much um, an explosive on-off effort. Um, so to do things like a minute on, minute off, or pyramid sessions are really good because they kind of replicate the short, uh, repeated, um, but explosive efforts of the race. Um, so those two, um, also like 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off, repeated for kind of 10 minute blocks is also good. Um, it's just about breaking down, like Ian said uh, earlier, um, the demands of the event. Um, so. You know, with cyclocross, it very much is um, repeated explosive efforts. It's not like a time trial, you know, like a time trial, 10-mile time trial. You just sit at threshold for 20 minutes. Um, so, I mean, that said, it is still important to um, incorporate a little bit of uh, threshold work. So the odd, you know, the odd 20-minute uh, sweet spot of threshold effort doesn't do any harm whatsoever. But it, the most important thing is to make... The, uh, it's more about the variability of the power. So, you know, in a in a cross race, you hit maybe a, a muddy bank or you hit a sand pit or whatever it is, and you have to really put a lot of power out, but for a short duration of time, and then then maybe you back off because you come onto a grass and you can you can ride smoother, and then the next minute you go around a corner and you have to make another explosive effort. So, it's very much an on-off. Um, you know, cyclocross races an hour or 40 minutes to an hour. Mm. And you would be, you would probably average around about threshold, but you never really sit at threshold. You know, it's very much, you know, really high power, and then you're backing off really low power. So you know, it's all about um, making your training sessions replicate that. So yeah, the pyramid session is really good because short explosive efforts, back off with recovery, and and go again. Um, <laughs> Sure. That kind of leads me on to the next question that I was being asked, Dan, is um, which power output uh, over time do you consider the most important? You know, which ones is more important than others? Is it a 20-minute power, 5-second power, 45-second power? Um, you know, just on uh, the basis of what you've said there, well, what do you believe if you – maybe if you were to choose one. Okay, I think this is what he's – Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not so much – I would say I would go towards um, the lowest – the you know the shorter shorter ones, but it's not so much about um, you know who can produce the most power for 30 seconds, for example. It's about you know like let's use Ian for a good example. His powers um, are good, but you know compared to maybe a road rider, um, you know really uh, world you know Ian's world class cyclist rider, but if you compare him to a world class road rider, his powers what it can be produce over 30 seconds, 1 minute, 5 minutes, 20 minutes, wouldn't be as good. But the um, the key for Ian is he can repeat those, yeah. you know, repeatedly. So maybe, you know, some people could do seven or 800 watts for 30 seconds, but they could only do it once or twice. Um, whereas Ian can do 600 watts, you know, repeatedly, you know, over and over again for an hour. So, yeah, yeah it's really not about how much power you can produce, it's about how many times you can repeat that. But yeah, the, the repetitiveness, yeah. I think yeah. that's something we've seen with Ian's and his power files and whatnot, that, you know, it's one of the standout um, features. Yeah. The reason why I can... Yeah, I think, you know, it's more about the efforts up to up to a minute, um, but it's how many times, mm -hmm. you know, the very short, repeated efforts. 
Yeah, just a wee bit on that. Um, I know some people know that we we work with a company called Surfafest, which is um, you know indoor training videos. And Ian and Dan actually designed a, a cyclocross specific workout for indoors. So in the turbo trainer, it's called Half as Easy. And it's kind of what Dan has been talking about there: the repetitiveness of the efforts, the short, sharp efforts. And uh, if anybody wants 39 minutes of pure torture, um, certainly go to the Surfer Fest and check out Half as Easy. But we'll maybe send you all an email later on with. Uh, yeah, with that, I mean, yeah. the Half is Easy video is very much like a cyclocross race. So um, one time Ian did a cyclocross race and he used a World Cup cyclocross race and he used a power meter on the bike. Um, and it pretty much, we ended up with, I think it was 180 uh, times he did um, 10 watts per kilo, so over 600 watts for 10 seconds. So it kind of showed that pretty much the entire race was 10 seconds on, 10 seconds off, 10 seconds on, 10 seconds off. You know, so it that's vastly different than if you did a 25 mile time trial and you just sat at 350 yeah. watts for the entire time. Cool. Okay, thanks very much, Dan. Um, Ian, just a uh, one for you here. Um, when you have limited time, what is your most effective training session? Yeah, um, this was another popular question. I think. The best session, if you're a bit struggling for time, the best session is to incorporate your intervals within an off-road session. So if you've got an off-road area that you can make up like a like a circuit, it doesn't have to be as long as a cyclocross circuit may be. Um, even if it's just three, four minutes round, just a circuit that you can get to grips with, kind of work your speed up on it as a warm-up. And then incorporate your intervals into the actual circuit. So Imagine doing your pyramids round an off-road circuit, so you're working the kind of physical demands and the technical demands all at the same time would be the best, most simple way to, to train for cyclocross if you're a bit stuck for time because the majority of people would maybe do their intervals on a turbo or in the dark during the winter months um, after work or even before work and then almost forget about the, the technical element and just turn up race day, um, sometimes lacking the, the technical elements, which is, which is hugely important in cross and sometimes overlooked um, by many. So if you incorporate your intervals within a cross session, that for me is the best session you can do by far because you're working kind of all parts of, of what you need to be as a bike rider to be good at cross. Um, and obviously doing doing the technical elements when you're tired during the recovery phase is is exactly like a race, like you're having to do the hurdles with 170, 180 heart rate, you're having to corner um, with kind of a bit of blurred vision sometimes, so that's the best way for me to, to train. Brilliant, thanks very much. Um, Dan, what uh, what road discipline would you recommend uh, as the best training for cyclocross? Um, certainly, the discipline that's close, you know, in terms of power profile, the, the discipline that would be closest um, to the demands of a cyclocross race would be, you know, um, circuit and criterium racing. Um, you know, they're both more or less one hour, um, very explosive. You know, on criteriums, you've got lots of kicks out of corners, um, maybe short recovery on the straight bits, then another corner. So that's ideal really for cyclocross. Um, but that said, I, I still think um, it's a good idea for cyclocross riders to get some, you know, longer road races, um, certainly in the, in the summertime, maybe June and July, you know, when you're building up a, you know, a solid foundation for the cross season. Um, you know, even stage races when you're doing, you know, back-to-back -back days of racing, really building your fitness up um, it is a great idea. Like certainly this year, <clears throat> Ian um, Ian did a lot of uh, a lot more road races than perhaps he'd done in the past. You know, he's doing a lot of the Premier Calendar races, maybe four or five four or five hours, which was, you know, just for training for him, but really good, um, you know, race race situation training um, and he also did um, several um, criteriums as well so yeah criteriums are definitely closest to the demands of cyclocross but I would also recommend doing 
road races as well. Cool. Thank you. Um, uh, how do you, uh, Ian, how do you just adjust your training throughout the season, uh, your focus areas throughout the season, from the early dry and fast races to the wet and slow muddy ones at the at the end of the season? So, how would you uh, adjust your training for the um, for the race situations that you'll be in? Um, it's a good question because what you need at the start of the season is entirely different to to maybe what you need in December when you're mud plugging um, kind of through a Belgian cow field knee deep in mud compared to what we're going to get in Vegas it, it's almost a, a different sport um, but the way the way you need to train for it is just by getting out there and training off road because um, unless there's huge downpours literally the day before a race in general the weather changes um, kind of fairly regularly through the winter so as long as you keep up your off-road sessions so I've been doing off-road sessions leading into Vegas and because it's relatively dry um, where I live it's it's fast and dry and kind of the conditions that we're going to get in Vegas whereas in mid-November it's going to be cold and wet in training and cold and wet in the races so to a certain extent your off-road sessions once again are the important ones where by keeping the training specific off-road at the right time of year your, your training conditions change as as they change in the races but obviously I know a lot of people won't be able to get kind of the off-road sessions in with work working full-time and maybe struggling for light in the evenings um, so you do have to take into account that towards November, December, January, those kind of wetter, colder months that maybe maybe your speed work, kind of really high cadence work that you might end up doing on the turbo with your pyramids and such like, maybe need to need to take a bit of a, a back step, keep them in there because it's still relative, but maybe a bit more strength work focused kind of big gear sprints, um, kind of a little bit over geared work as well to to keep that um, muscle tension and the kind of specific over geared work that you might have to do in a race when, when conditions are really tough. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, keep in mind what you've got coming up at the weekend as well. I mean, if you know a race at the weekend is really hilly um, and strength sapping, then make sure you get out the week, two weeks before it. Um, in some hilly areas or do some slightly overgeared work on the turbo or vice versa if you know there's a super fast race coming up then get out and do some kind of one two minute full full gas efforts out on a flat road somewhere it's really kind of mix up um, the terrain where you do your efforts to, to make you an all round bike rider because at the end of the day as a cyclocross rider you have to be kind of an all-rounder you can't really be a climber or, or a sprinter or or such you just have to be um, good in all conditions really okay uh, thanks very much Ian um, Dan just one for you uh, I suppose it kind of relates a wee bit to, to what Ian was talking about um, what off the bike strength training drills uh, do you do pre-season and during the race season and do they differ if you are doing them um, I'm a little bit on the fence on um, on this subject, and I think it depends from person to person. So, um, some people really find benefits to doing, you know, gym work, and others um, others not so much. Um, I think it depends a little bit on the your body type. So, if you're more a muscle bound sort of person, you could handle it quite well, whereas the skinny, skinnier guys, um, it can cause a lot more uh, damage to their muscles. Um, and the other thing to remember is, if you do a lot of um, you know, heavy strength work, it really is, um, you, it really does affect your training. So, you know, if you do a gym, gym, gym session on a Tuesday night, you know, you're going to struggle to train really intensively on the Wednesday so um, with Ian for example we have done some gym work um, we tend we don't do any gym work at all in the um, 
in the sea in the dry season. So and we tend to do it in the early uh, spring and the early summer, and then we we kind of probably haven't done any gym work now for a good six weeks. Um, and we you know we only probably did one one day a week as well. It's something that really haven't um, this year. We've really spent a lot of less time focusing on on gym work, but. You know, he, he was doing some squats, some leg presses, uh, bench presses. Um, core work, I think, is good because core work isn't, um, you know, so damaging to the muscles. Um, and when, you know, when Ian started off, it was more um, heavy strength work, so, you know, big weights. Um, and then after, like, maybe six weeks, make it a little bit more explosive. So, um, you know, lighter weights, but doing really explosive uh, presses. Um, I think it's you know you can try it, and for some people it works well. Some people it doesn't work so well. So it kind of does depend person. You know, does differ vastly from person to person. Yeah. Th thanks very much. Uh, and Don, just um, one other one for you is uh, how many hours training per week does a male veteran? have to put in the training bank to ride well, e.g. top five in regional races? So a bit of a, a broad question, but really how many hours do you feel, as we, we do coach a, a, a large number of, of um, yeah. cross um, trainers in the in the Again, it, it varies person to person. It depends massively on, you know, people's lifestyle. So, you know, if you've got a demanding job and a family, it's not, it's not so much how many hours you can put in. It's how many hours can you put in productively and and recover. You know, so everybody could probably pr train for several hours a day if if they really force themselves to. But if you don't have the time to recover from that training, you know, you're just not going to uh, get the benefits. You're just going to dig a deep hole. So, I mean, on in general, I think around about Eight hours, maybe eight to ten hours max would be um, would be about about right for a veteran rider. And you know, cyclocross is one of the cycling disciplines that a lot of people choose because it's you don't need to do as many hours. You know, you're only racing for well, a veteran you probably race for 40, 45 minutes. A senior, um, a maximum of one hour. So you know, even Ian, for example probably doesn't on average do more than 15 hours a week you know um, so I think probably eight to ten hours a week probably eight hours would be you know optimal um, I do you know do know lots of veteran riders and um, who have been you know like nas top national level national champions uh, national trophy winners that sort of thing and they're you know rarely doing more than 10 hours a week yeah, I think well, that's one of the benefits that, that I suppose we see with people who come to us and take, you know, our certain um, specific second cross coaching packages and whatnot is getting that balance between the, the hours you have available, what you can make productive, and also, you know, how you um, how you really, you know, focus that towards your objective and making your training specific. I think yeah. there's, a, there's a big misconception that we see a lot out there that, you know, there is, a, you know, to get better, you have to up the hours, you got to up the volume, and a lot of people, um, you know, say that, you know, or have the pretense, I want to get better, I have to do more, and it's not so much doing more, it's doing it more specific and making it more tailored, and I suppose yeah, that's de where we're worried. Definitely, um, you know, two people could be training for 10 hours a week each, and they could be vastly, you know, vastly different, you know, if you just go out and do a lot of zone, um, zone two work, endurance, type work for 10 hours you're not going to achieve that much whereas if you make it really specific and really structured interval type training on 10 hours that that's a lot of training um, so you know the more specific it is the, the less you can get away with even six hours you know top five regional level you know perhaps six hours um, you know I'd say optimally about eight hours for a veteran would be would be about right and, you know, so it's only just over an hour a day. Um, you know, most people would perhaps have um, a day off on a Monday and maybe another one later on in the week, and then do an hour 
of high intensive training midweek uh, would make most sense and then you know um, a couple of two hour sessions on the weekend and straight away you're already up there in eight hours so yeah. it's it takes some commitment you know with family and work but it's not it's not like you have to you know commit hours and hours on end so yeah okay Thanks it so also much. depends obviously on the time of year you know you perhaps do a little bit more in the summer than you would in the race season yeah Okay, cool. Um, we're just going to move on to another topic which uh, uh, a lot of people have asked about is um, obviously racing, different aspects of, of racing. So we're going to try and get through a little bit on this. So um, Ian, just one for you uh, is a very popular question that was asked is about warm-up routines. What do you feel is the best warm-up uh, process before a cyclocross cross race? Right, basically um, the best warm-up process for, for a cross is very similar to um, kind of a, a crit warm-up, mountain bike warm-up. They they're all pretty much the same. Even a, mine's kind of, um, I've seen the, the team pursuit GB guys, their warm-up is very similar. So you're looking at kind of five to ten minutes gentle gentle riding and then a ramped kind of effort up through either your power zones or your heart rate zones up to and slightly above the kind of threshold and then so that would take approximately 10 minutes to ramp up through your zones like two to three minutes each zone um, getting out of breath getting a bit of a sweat on and then kind of five minutes easy and then just a few activation sprints so not super long, not super hard, just need to activate the muscles, get the blood flowing. Um, these are approximately 10 to 20 seconds long, two to three minutes recovery between each, um, carried out on the turbo, rollers, or the road. And then just keep your legs turning until the start of the race. The whole process should only take 20 to 30 minutes, depending how you feel. Maybe sometimes you feel a bit blocked, and so you maybe do a bit more before you start the ramp or maybe do an extra sprint at the end or um, maybe a bit more um, turning your legs over before the start of the race but you don't need to be on the turbo for hours and hours um, there's a famous kind of leave it all on the turbo kind of warm up where you see guys warming up for hours on end sprinting away for minutes and minutes it's simply not needed you just need to get everything kind of switched on and working and then you should be ready for the start line. The, the muscles just need to be warm on the start line and you need to have got a bit of a sweat on, out of breath at some point during your warm up which the ramp and the sprints will do and you should be good to go. The other important thing to remember with cross is nine times out of ten you'll, you'll ride around the course the morning of an event or yeah nine times out of ten you should ride around the course before the event just to see where you're going and check out lines and obstacles etc so by the time you get to the start line on that day you should have ridden your bike for probably 40 to 60 minutes anyway including the warm-up so the warm-up just needs to be short and specific once again and don't overdo things Cool. I think uh, another thing just out that is not so much on the on the actual physical warm up, but it's just being organised. From my yeah. experience, and and you know, different athletes, be it a criterium racing, time trialling, or or obviously cyclocrosses, you know, knowing where your equipment is. If you've got to change wheels, have it close at hand. You know, have your race bottle there. You know, don't be spending 20 minutes trying to make up your race bottle. You know, because you you've been warming up too long. You know, all them sort of things is. I suppose coming down to timing and I suppose coming with experience as well, it helps, you know, and starting to see your, your own routine. But um, I see a lot of people getting flustered before a race um, unnecessarily because they're just not organized. Uh, so just another another tip to that. Um, another little tip would be um, with that organization sort of thing, if you are warming up on rollers and turbo, even in the winter months, it's easy to get a sweat on. Um, and get quite warm when you when you're doing your warm up. So a really good tip would be once you've finished your warm up, if it's a static warm up especially, would be a really good idea to change your base layer before you go to the start line because especially at local regions and even national level, 
Um, you can be stood around a while for gridding process to take place and the last thing you need is a soaking wet base layer um, actually making you cold before the start. So change your base layer after warm-ups is always a good one. That's a good tip. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Dan, uh, one for you. What is the, the best pre-race meal or food choice? Uh, I suppose it's quite variant, that per person to person, but what do you feel or what would you recommend best pre-race meal and food? Um, I think if we asked Ian this question, I'd know the answer. Um, every time I've gone to a race with him, he seems to have tins and tins of rice pudding like scattered all over the place. Um, I think, you know, rice pudding's great because it's it's um, obviously high high carbohydrate, but it's quite light. So for a one-hour race, you need obviously you need to be well fueled, but you don't want to be feeling heavy on your stomach. Um, so if you're, um, most of the senior races are in the afternoon, you know, around about 2 o'clock. So you've probably had breakfast already, um, and then you need maybe a couple of hours before the race just to top up the energy a little bit. So something like rice pudding is perfect. Um, for the veteran races, you know, they tend to be perhaps around 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, you could get away... Uh, quite easily just with eating breakfast. Um, so again, you don't want to. You need to eat enough that you. Most people would probably eat three hours before a race. Um, it, it just varies from first person. You need to experiment, but you know, cereals, porridge, toast, that sort of thing. It needs to be good, um, high nutrition, high uh, carbohydrate food, without feeling too bloated, you know, you don't want to be, if you're doing a four hour road race, you need to eat obviously a lot more and you can ride into the race, you can kind of get that bloated feeling out a little bit, whereas a cyclocross race, you've got to remember, you're going off the start line flat out and if you've got, you know, full English in your stomach, you know, it's not going to feel good at all, so, you know, you need to experiment, try things out in training, what you can tolerate, but certainly light cereals, um, you know, uh, rice pudding, that sort of thing. So it's high carbohydrate, but quite light food is would be my recommendation. So no bacon and eggs and uh, no. sort of bread then. All right. No, well maybe you know eggs, egg on toast, scrambled egg on toast. You know some people can tolerate quite well, but I'd certainly leave the bacon for the um, leave the bacon certainly for the cycle cross race. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, Dan. Um, Ian, one for you. There's a wee bit probably on maybe what you're touching on about the warm-up and feeling dead and what before. So um, this guy saying that uh, I find when I taper for a cross race, I arrive with dead legs and poor form. What's the best way to taper for a race on Sunday? I picked this question because I think um, a lot of people struggle when they try to taper for events and... I think a lot of people misunderstand a taper um, in terms of what it is. A lot of people see a taper as literally just taking it super easy into the event, um, maybe having three, four, even five days kind of, oh, I'm just riding easy because I've got a big race at the weekend. But an actual structured taper should be cutting down on your hours that you're doing. So... So maybe if you're doing eight to ten hours a week, you tape a week, maybe only five or six hours um, in the week. So you're cutting out the, a bit of volume, but you actually keep in the intensity. So you need to keep in those efforts to keep your body opened up. And a lot of people, I think, take it almost too easy into their goal events and their body just kind of begins to shut down and become almost blocked um, before the race. And... I know a lot of people I've, I work with um, struggle to get their heads around the fact that the day before a race I give them a reasonably hard ride to do um, just because you need to be well opened up for a cross race. If, Say for a road race, if you don't feel great for the first hour of a road race, it's not the end of the world. You can kind of ride into it a bit and then very often if you haven't felt great early on, your legs kind of come good once you've opened up towards the end of a road race. Um, but in cross, if you don't feel good for that first hour, the race is done and dusted. And 
you might be feeling good for the drive home, but it's all a bit late then. So you need to keep your specific um, intervals in your training leading up to goal events, but just maybe of an evening instead of maybe doing a two hour or an hour and a half ride, cut it back to 45 minutes or an hour, but just keep your efforts in there. Um, and then hopefully come race day, um, you're, you're still opened up, you've still got the efforts in your legs and, and you're ready to go. Um, that's kind of, I think, the biggest problem um, most people have when when they're coming across kind of tapering for events. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, it goes across a lot of disciplines, the same thing, but specifically for cyclocross where it's so explosive, certainly at the start, you know, it, uh, it can be, you know, it's critical, I suppose. Um, and funny, that leads me on to my, to my next question, uh, Dan. Um, I struggle with uh, start pace. Then I find I'm coming back through from the middle of the race. Any tips in training for the start? Yeah, um, it's a really good question. And a lot of people don't practice um, mm. the starts either um, at all or you know, nowhere near enough. So first of all, obviously, a cyclocross race, um, like Ian said earlier, you warm up, but then you could be stood on the start line for at least 10 minutes, sometimes more. Um, generally, it's quite cold, so your core temperature drops drops right down. Um, so it is important to warm up, um, you know, to try and nullify those things as much as possible, but even so, you are going to still be stood on the start line, you are going to cool down. Um, and then you start off, you know, it's quite an explosive effort, maybe 30 seconds flat out, and it settles down a little bit, and you still sustain, you know, a good a good pace. Um, so in training, it's really important to replicate those efforts. Um, so you can do on your uh, skills training on your circuits, you can practice starts, but it's also important to not just um, stop for a few seconds and, you know, start the effort and then go back to start, do it again. I would always recommend just standing there for one or two minutes just to let you, you know, just to let everything just drop down a little bit so it's, it's as close to race conditions as possible. Um, get used to making that effort because some people can make the effort quite well, especially the initial start, you know, the first 30 seconds, first minute. But you have to be, um, you have to do it so you're used to making that effort so it doesn't impact the rest of your race. So there's no point, you know, if, if Chris Hoy, for example, who's obviously a kilo rider, if he if he did a cross race, yeah, he'd get off the line really fast and he'd probably lead the race through the first corner. But then would he be able to continue that effort and race? You know, you have to be able to do that effort, recover from that effort, and then race, you know, um, you know, really high heart rate, really high power for, throughout the remainder of the race. So. It's as much as practicing the start, but it's also as much as making sure the start, so you condition your body so the start doesn't impact the rest of your race. Um, so perhaps start doing things like doing the start, the initial 30 seconds uh, really hard, but then continuing the effort for another minute or two afterwards, um, and then settling into a more like threshold pace. Um, but again, it's, it's about... Um, being really specific with the demands of the race. So, you know, a cross race is, um, you know, really explosive effort initially off the start line, then kind of a, an almost um, another two minutes, you know, kind of VO2 max effort, and then settle down into, um, into, the, into the race pace. So replicating all those things in training is vital. So practicing you know, uh, getting a circuit and practicing um, the initial start, the next couple of minutes, and then another, you know, three or four minutes at race pace, stop spin for a few minutes, cooling down again, doing that again, you know, a couple of times during a skills training session could be, uh, you know, could really help you. So you, you're able to make the start efforts, but still, the, the start efforts don't impact the rest of your race. Cool, thank you very much. Dan? Ian, uh, quick question: Tubs or clinchers? Um, 
I think this very much depends on people's budgets, but 100% tubs. <laughs> if you can afford tubs, um, and obviously the issue with tubs is they're obviously glued on, so you can't can't go for a last minute tread change if you haven't got multiple sets of wheels. So for me, um, if you go go tubs, go for the kind of mud tread option because uh, that will see you good through through when it's dry as well as when it's muddy rather than going for the maybe super fast treads or the intermediate treads where where they're just not up to the kind of really muddy muddy days but a hundred percent um, tubs for racing I mean a lot of people don't don't get it and then and then they ride a set of tubs for the first time in a cross race and they're like, ah, oh, right, I get it. <laughs> it's just the the feel and the grip with a tubular um, just isn't matched by clinches. Um, so for me, 100% kind of tubs. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Dan, uh, how do I get to the next level? After two seasons, I'm finishing mid-pack. I'm feeling strong, but what else can I do to improve? So what would you recommend for somebody who's maybe getting a little bit stagnated, maybe after a couple of seasons, quite strong, but doesn't seem to be improving? Um, I think just come to us for coaching, really. <laughs> no, I mean, um, in all seriousness, um, it's difficult to say, you know, because there's, there's lots of things that can impact performance, you know, so... Just you need to think about things that um, can help your performance. So is your diet as good as it can be? You know, are you getting uh, enough rest? You know, is your weight, you know, reasonable? You know, that sort of thing. You know, th there's a lot of things you can do in training, but there's also you could train. You could have the best training plan in the world, but if you if you do a lot of things, you know, if you go to bed late. You drink too much beer. You diet. You know, you eat at McDonald's every night. You know, all those things, you know, can impact massively on your racing. Um, so you need to make sure all those. You know, I'm not suggesting you have to live life completely like a monk. You know, but you know, have a look at your diet. Question is that, is that good? You know, and your lifestyle, getting plenty of rest, that sort of thing. And then once you've got all those fundamentals in place, then you you know start looking at your training. Like we keep saying, the training has to be um, you know race specific, uh, really focused. Um, and I think the most the biggest thing you're going to do to improve would be to have a good off season. So the amount of people that um, like for road racers, obviously their off season is winter time and then the summer's their race season, and so across the other way around. But the amount of riders on multiple disciplines that in the off-season, they they kind of really reduce the training, and they just float around, and then they get towards the race season, and then they get serious again. But they spend the first few months of the season getting their fitness back up, and all they're doing is they get back to the same level. So I know people have been at the same level for years and years, and some people that's fine because you know they're happy and they don't necessarily want to you know move forward and 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 better themselves. But some people really want to you know step up. And I think a really solid um, off season, finish your season, and then um, really um, analyze things. You know what went right, what what went wrong, and really focus on the training, replicating the training uh, around the race and demands that you've got coming. And really getting a solid off season uh, leading into following season would be would be one way to really step up. Mm. Yeah, I think we obviously see uh, there's a lot of people, you know, um, talking to us at the minute and obviously looking at different types of coaching and uh, advice at the minute. So it is a really critical time right now, I suppose, for certainly for the domestic season coming in. Um, and as Dan said, it's it's critical, I suppose, these weeks in the previous weeks uh, and months past of, of how you're going to perform come November and December time. Um, thanks very much. Uh, Ian, just one last one on this uh, on this topic. Uh, for grassroots courses with uh, single track bottlenecks, blast it into the hole shot, keeping ahead of the queue, or pace it off the start. What's your advice on that? Um, I think 
this leads on nicely to kind of a general rule where um, a good start will, won't win you a race, but a bad start can lose you a race. So um, a grassroots level where there are kind of single track bottlenecks pretty early on usually, um, you've got to take into account your fitness level and how it's going to affect the next 50 or 30, 40 minutes of your race. So if you're gridded well and you're racing for the win, then I'd say you definitely go for the whole shot and then you can dictate the pace when the course narrows and recover while you're in front kind of thing and kind of really make people ride to your strategy, which obviously you're going to ride to your strengths, so you're in control of the race. It's always going to be the best bet. But if you're gridded at the back and maybe your, your goal is a top 50, going for the whole shot is obviously going to compromise the entire race. So in that situation, you're going to be looking to pace it off the start, stay out of trouble, um, maybe not lose places off the start, but hold your position and then pick people off. Those people have gone too hard, maybe going for the whole shot who shouldn't have been going for it. Pick them off over the next 10, 15 minutes. Um, I mean, a few guys I coach, um, some of them go off way too hard, and then the next week you tell them to literally ride the first lap almost within themselves, almost like they're holding back. And it's amazing the feedback you get, like the number of people that they overtake over the next few laps. So definitely um, you can't win a race with your start, but um, you can certainly lose one with a bad start. So concentration and kind of taking into account your goals and performance level before before the race starts is the, is the best bet. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so we're just going to move on to just another topic. We had a lot of questions come in from people that are new to cyclocross. Um, so we're going to ask just a few specific questions on that to help those that are that are new to cross. Um, so, Dan, first, first one to you here. I'm new to cyclocross. Uh, my winter training is usually long, easy base miles. How do I incorporate cyclocross racing and training with that? Okay. Um, first of all, th this picture, that's Ian at the National Champs last year, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. um, I'm assuming with the question, um, when you, um, I'm assuming that you're perhaps a road, um, you know, road rider who's uh, using the winter um, to prepare, um, you know, and that's why you're doing the long, easy base miles. If you was a cyclocross rider, certainly. Um, you know, wouldn't be certainly wouldn't be the way to train. And even if you're a road rider doing long, easy base miles, you know, I'd I'd really argue that that's not the most productive way. But we could spend a whole entire webinar. You know, that's a subject that we could spend a lot of time discussing. Um, but certainly, for um, tends to be two main types of people doing cyclocross. So. The majority of people, that's it. This is their race season, so they're doing the cyclocross race. They've spent the entire summer preparing, and this is their race season. Like with the road uh, or mountain bike, you know, the winter times they're off season. The summer times they're race season. Um, it's almost, um, I think, by doing the cyclocross is good because you're still getting some really high intensive work, which like I touched on earlier, I really do believe that's the way to go, you know, in the off-season, still doing intensive work. So by doing um, cyclocross perhaps one day of the weekend and then maybe um, doing a longer ride uh, on the other day would be a great way to, would be a great way to incorporate it. Now, um, local to me, there's the Knotts and Derby Cyclocross League, which is on a Saturday which I really think would be a better day to do it because you can do the race um, while you're relatively fresh. Perhaps you've had a day off on the Friday or an easy day on the Friday. Um, and then you go out on the Sunday and you do a longer, um, more road-based road training. If you do it the other way around, it's okay. But it means if you're doing the longer day on the Saturday, it really will impact the, the performance in the race on the Sunday. 
So if you think for most people, you know, full-time jobs, family, that sort of thing, it makes more sense to do more uh, shorter intensive training in the week and then do, um, you know, do um, the longer rides at the weekend. But if you're using cross to uh, supplement your training for the road, you know, doing one, one day of the weekend doing a high intensive road tra uh, cross race, which is really going to be, you're going to really push yourself more than you can on your own in training. And then doing the other day of the weekend, you know, uh, more endurance based ride, would that would be the perfect way to do it for me. I think um, it's a wee bit of a, maybe a, on, a, on a broader subject is, of course, you know, the people that are maybe aiming for the road season, that the long steady miles is the is the necessity and, and I suppose the, the meat and veg of the of the pre season training where in effect and, and I suppose what we do and what a lot of you know the sort of modern training methods is that, you know, there's a lot more specifics and things as essential to your performance come competition, be it your road competition than just doing long steady miles. Um, of course they're they're very important and, and critical and whatnot, but you know the, the intensity that you can get from cyclocross racing albeit potentially you might lose a little bit over a period of weeks or months that you are doing the cyclocross season you might lose a wee bit of that um, endurance or base miles but you are going to gain more on the intensity that can be of major benefit come April May time um, I suppose yeah, you look I at mean, most, most people win or lose road races because of the power duration they can put the power they can put out over the duration of you know maybe two to five minutes whereas Everybody focuses on doing, you know, three or four hour endurance races where, you know, some people get dropped after an hour because they can't go, they can't go fast enough. You know, very rarely do you not win a or do you win or lose a, a road race because you can't ride for the duration of the mm -hmm. of the event. It, it it's always because you can't ride, you know, um, the intensity of the event, not the duration. So, you know, I think it's Things have changed in uh, research over the year, and you know, modern day training is very much um, about focusing on the kind of the intensity of the training rather than the, the volume of the training. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, Ian. One for you. Uh, if you had just one tip for a pure roadie doing a first cross race, what would that be? It'd definitely be sensible tire pressures. Um, number of people that turn up to their first cross race, look at the sidewall of the tyre and see maybe a max of 50, 60 PSI and they pump their tyres up to the max. Um, cross tyres aren't really meant to be pumped up that hard. That's the maximum you can actually put in them. So a uh, baseline figure obviously depends on weight, etc. Obviously if you're super light or super heavy, uh, you need to adjust this, but I'd say approximately with clinches, you're looking at 30 psi. Um, certainly no more than that um, for a starting kind of baseline figure. But yeah, the biggest biggest thing I'd say is don't pump the tyres up to to the maximum what they say on the sidewall. Uh, and just I suppose on that, from obviously that varies from maybe from course to course, and from you know. Uh, you know, muddy to dry and whatnot. Do you have any, I suppose, general preferences or what you would do, tire pressure ways? Um, you know, from maybe a muddy course to being a dry. For example, Las Vegas is probably going to be dry. What's the difference in your tire pressure between that and uh, you know, uh, Valkenburg in, in in October time? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm going to change tire treads. So, um, the first kind of question that you've got to ask yourself is which which tread is the most applicable for the day and the course and the conditions and then after you've chosen your correct tread that's when you're looking at the tire pressures but nine times out of ten once I've picked between the treads which I'm going to use I start normally I weigh like 64 65 kilos to give everyone kind of a base baseline figure because weight makes a huge difference to to how you handle each pressure and I normally start with 25 psi no matter what the conditions so that's like the highest I ever run basically so in Vegas 
I'll probably run 25 psi. Um, it depends, obviously, on the course, etc., on the day. But that's kind of the highest I ever run, and normally go down from there. So in muddy conditions, um, as soon as soon as I get onto the course, if I start slipping, sliding, then immediately stop after 100, 200 meters of the course and begin to um, let them down. Um, and in terms of how low you can go, if you're running tubulars and they're stuck on properly, um, national champs the other year at Bradford, I ran like 15 PSI. So don't be worried about going low. And um, if you need to go low to get the get the traction, then then go that low. But obviously, take into account: is there anywhere to puncture on the course um, before before you go that low? But that's kind of the range that I work within, kind of 15 to 25 PSI. Okay, thanks very much, Ian. Um, to another one for you here, and uh, this person has never done cyclocross, uh, and it would be a good alternative. Would it be a good alternative to mountain biking and turbo training for the winter? So, would cyclocross? Would you swap it and do cyclocross instead of mountain biking or turbo training in the winter time? Absolutely, it's a lot more fun. <laughs> hmm. um, Yep. Definitely for me, I see cyclocross as obviously it's my main event and main goal. Um, but if your main goal are mountain biking or road, then I just see cross as being a great kind of alternative to keep you focused throughout the cross um, throughout the winter. Sorry. Um, so obviously it's going to keep you sharp. Um, if you're a roadie, then it could possibly help your bike handling skills. And even if you're a mountain biker, um, there aren't many mountain bike races that take place in mud. But when the odd one comes round, um, you quite often find people are struggling with the conditions because it, the grip levels just aren't there. And it's almost kind of turns it round to cross conditions where you're struggling for grip and you're really having to think about where you're putting your power down, where you're doing your braking, etc. And so the, the fundamental skills of riding fast in a cross race do actually transfer quite well across to road and mountain biking. And then the bonus is, is the fitness like Dan talked about, getting the intensity in. Um, very often you, you never try as hard when, when you haven't got a number on your back. So put a number on your back, get involved with cyclocross race at the weekend and you might even see kind of your performance on the road and the mountain bike come the next summer improved because you get things real specific, short, sharp through the winter along with kind of maybe your normal training. Um, so definitely give it a go and nine times out of ten people just fall in love with it and really enjoy the events. So just give it a go. Cool. Thank you. Um, just on the, the last question from... Uh from what we have uh, we've been asked here is to you Dan how do I learn the basics I sort of mount dismount so how would I go around starting to learn the basics technique wise um, I think I'll hand this one over to Ian I wouldn't say I'm an expert on the technical side okay um, in terms of the um, technical elements, jumping on and off your bike, etc. Um, we did a yeah, we did a webinar last year and we went through kind of the, the basic techniques you'll need to use. So um, it'd be good. Um, I think there's still a link to it on the Dig Deep website, yep. is it? Yeah, and I'll send it out to everybody who's registered, a link to the, the webinar we've done last year, yeah. Yeah, so we ran, we ran through kind of the basic tips um, on there, and um, I think I, I answered this exact question on there, so it would be good to have a review of that. But there are lots of videos on YouTube, and the majority of them are pretty good um, in teaching you the correct way to, to dismount and remount, which is normally the fundamental skill that road riders and mountain bikers struggle with. Um, the kind of fluidity of the movement of jumping back on the bike without that without that skip um, or hop as people call it and getting off the bike safely and not ending up in a heap um, while not having to stop to get off the bike is is fundamental so yeah YouTube it and check out the webinar we did um, last year okay 
Um, okay, just a, a few questions here that are going to go through. There was uh, quite a lot of questions coming in there um, when we were having our, our uh, you know, um, pre-recorded questions. So one has come in on when would be effective to start doing constructive training training again after a cyclocross race. So somebody here is uh, is hit about an 80 TSS for the race. Probably the race is going to be around you know 50 minutes to an hour 10. Um, so when would be the most effective to, to start training again post uh, post race? Would it be a Tuesday or a Wednesday? Um, I suppose it depends on your fitness uh, in general. But Dan, I maybe get you to down to that. Well, yeah. What's your thoughts? You know, certainly in terms of TSS, you know, 80 isn't isn't really massive. So you don't need you don't need a lot of time off. Um, there's other things to consider, you know, if you use TSS, which is training stress score, it doesn't always incorporate, you know, the things like the running and and everything else. So, you know, it can feel harder than, you know, maybe 80 if you went out and did a, did a road ride. But I think for most people, if you um, had a, an easy day on the Monday, a recovery ride or a day off, you know, you should more or less be ready to go on the Tuesday. Um, maybe if it's a really hard race, you might want to do a less intensive training on, on the Tuesday. You know, may, you could still do interval training. You could do, you know, um, maybe some threshold work or some kind of sweet spot work. But you might want to leave the really explosive stuff to the Wednesday. But... I think generally by a Tuesday you should be pretty well recovered and you know you can get a couple of days uh, you know for most people cyclocross is at the weekend so you'd get some good training Tuesday Wednesday Thursday and then start backing off a little bit for the for the weekend racing. Yeah and I suppose that's uh, a little bit what you talked about earlier on and that um, pre-season training going up to it that you know the better fitness you have going into the race season Obviously, the more you can recover quicker after race, thus meaning you could actually train and productive and uh, get more productive sessions in midweek, so you can yeah. keep that progression going. I think what we find a lot of guys is that the the racing takes that much out of them that they can't, you know, do as much productive training midweek uh, to help keep the progress growing, and then that sees the form going quite up and down um, during during the the season. Yeah, um, I think you know keep using Ian for an example, he tends to, you know, we get his fitness as high as possible during the off season. So when you hit the race season, it's full on full on racing and, you know, he may be racing once or twice at each weekend and there's not a massive amount of time to train. So he'll you know, as a an example for the average week, he'll race maybe Saturday and Sunday and then a day off for an easy ride Monday and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday I'll do really specific training but it'll be short so it'll be 90 minutes to two hours so you're not you're not really topping up the training load you're just kind of maintaining it and you know he has periods where mm -hmm. right it's full on racing now for the next six weeks we just maintain the form, maintain and then maybe have a bit of time off and, and have a period where we can build up the training but generally when you're in that really specific race period you don't have the time to kind of build the fitness up so it's really important to get the fitness as high as possible you know before the start of the season and that helps out if um, if you don't do that so much it's okay while things are going okay uh, going well but then if you have to have a week off because you've got the flu I mean Let's face it. In the in the, um, November, December, January, it's a time when there's most bugs and people getting sick and all the rest of it. And if you, the higher your fitness level is, the less that will affect you. If you do have to have time off, you always you're always going to have a week off the bike in the winter due to sickness. You know, unless you've really got a concrete immune system. You know, most people you you almost have to second guess that you're going to have to have some time off for sickness. So the higher you can get your fitness before the start of the season, you know, the, the longer it's going to see you through. And the longer, when you do hit 
top form, the longer that form's gonna gonna last. You know, if you don't have much of a base, you can hit top form, you know, quite quickly, but it it won't last as long either. So, you know, the the off season, the summer for the side cross rider is is vital really. Okay, thanks very much. Um, just uh, a couple of real quick questions here on technique. Ian, to you, uh, yep. what techniques do you use um, in tight cornering to stop the back wheel slipping out? Um, it obviously kind of depends on the corner and the conditions, etc. But I'll take a stab at, I think, what they're trying to get at. Um, and I think... A fundamental where where cross is different technique to to maybe road and and mountain biking is in the corners, um, and you got to think about um, motorbikes and motorsport where um, you're either braking or accelerating, and that's the best way to keep grip on your tyres. So entering a corner, you're braking, then you come off the brakes, and as soon as you come off the brakes, um, you should be beginning to think about accelerating. So in cycling, that means pedaling. So the technique with cross to stop your rear wheel actually spinning out is what most people think is the last thing you want to do, and you actually need to start pedaling, because as soon as you start pedaling, there's drive going through the rear wheel, and so the rear wheel is actually beginning to dig in to the surface. And so the earlier you can get on the power and get on the pedals is actually the better. Obviously, if the corner's super tight and you're going to catch your pedal, you can't do this. Um, but as soon as you're through the apex, you need to be on the pedals and putting drive through that rear wheel. And at least then, if, if the rear wheel does slip, you're in control of it because you're applying the pressure to the tyres and through through the pedals. So, um, yeah, I think you need to get on your pedals early and um, really practice makes perfect with this one. So get out to your local park, set up some, some tight corners and just work out how early you can actually get on the pedals. Um, and pedaling actually helps you turn the bike by dropping the inside foot, your weight transfers to the inside of the bike and means you can actually turn super tight, obviously without clipping your pedal, but you can turn really, really tight um, with with the pedaling technique. So get out there, maybe maybe YouTube a few races and watch the top guys through through the corners and you'll see what I mean with, with the pedaling technique and just practice that. Okay. Um, thanks very much. I think we've we've kind of run over here a wee bit, but uh, I think we've got through an awful lot this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending, all the uh, all the guys and all the girls. We've had, a, like I say, a really big turnout, was you know goes to show the popularity of cyclocross across the world. Um, you know, anybody who would like to learn more uh, or would like to look at our personalised coaching and our certainly our specific six and twelve week. Uh, training plan specific for cyclocross uh, working with us um, please feel free to drop us a line we'll be emailing everybody out um, in the in the coming days uh, a link to this recording and also a link to our previous um, recording as well from that we did last year also different bits and pieces on information and, and how you can um, work with us so if anybody would like to learn more please drop us a line to info at digdeepcoaching.com and uh, I'd just like to say you know thanks very much for everybody attending uh, Don and Ian. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.